let's design some digital innovations right here, right now, right today. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's certainly a lot of digital innovations out there already. Fortunes have been made, life has been changed, the world has evolved, but while we might not be the first, we are certainly not too late. I'll show you today there are many more possibilities out there. So let's go about it. How do we go about it? Well, first of all, we need to understand the theory. So we understand how that game works. And the name of the game of innovations is combinations. And we look a little bit into the theory and see like where do innovations actually come from? And then we look at how to create digital innovations. And we do that by continuing what we uh, started in the last session. And uh, we look at some examples of how to create digital innovations from digital trades because Spoiler alert, that's where innovation comes from, from the combinations of, well, for lack of a better term, I called it here digital traits. And so during the last session, uh, we looked at several traits from digital communication. That's the transmission of information through space, digital storage, that's the transmission of information through time, and computation, that's the transformation of information in space and time. And then what we do is we have these digital traits that now we have a basic understanding of, and there are many more. I mean, this list is not exclusive or exhaustive. And now what we do is we take that and you know, we create some new combinations. For example, we take these two here, see what we can do, or we take these four here, or we take those here, and we will see that many of the innovations that already exist, and that's what we will study, that are very well known in the digital age, or some phenomena that we know from uh, the filter bubbles to the echo chambers, from the sharing economy to crowdsourcing, uh, from augmented intelligence to, to media concentration. Many of the, form of the phenomena that we see in the digital age actually come from different you know, combinations of, of these kind of digital traits. All right, so let's get going with the theory. What is innovations? Where do new things actually come from? Well, we take it in, in a definition from the economist Joseph Schumpeter. They call him the prophet of innovation. And he has a definition of innovation that is commonly used nowadays. And he defined innovation consists in carrying out new combinations. And so that's it. So innovations are just combinations. So let's look at maybe the most prolific inventor we ever had, Thomas Edison, more a thousand patents in the United States alone and, and many more international. I mean, he literally invented the light bulb. I mean, the light bulb went off with Thomas Edison. And how did he do that? Well, he carried out a lot of new combinations then. He must have had, if we follow that definition of of innovation, right? Uh, so let's look at what his workflow was. Where did he work? Well, he had a big laboratory. And what was in there? Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory occupied two city blocks. Edison said he wanted the lab to have a stock of almost every conceivable material. It contained more than 8,000 kinds of chemicals, every kind of screw made, every size of needle, every kind of cord or wire, hair of human, horses, hawks, cows, rabbits, goats, minks, camels, silk in every texture, cocoons, various kinds of hoofs, shark's teeth, deer horns, tortoise shells, cork, resin, varnish and oil, ostrich feathers, a peacock tail, jet amber, rubber and all horse. Okay, so he had a lot of things he could work with and then he combined them tirelessly. Now, as the story goes, famously, when he tried to invent the light bulb, he could not find the right combination. You know, back in the days, the, the idea was kind of like in the air with the light bulb. He had electricity and you know, the things with the, with the candles got kind of like old and, and things were about to move on. And the idea was when you put electricity through something, you also you were kind of like was glowing, but then he he really, he failed a lot and it became a running gag. People were like laughing at him with his light bulb idea, yeah, right. And people, you know, made fun of this. And at one point Edison stopped and said like, look guys, um, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have not failed once. I have successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work to invent the light bulb. And then he continued to carry out 
more combinations and more combinations and more combinations. I don't know how many um, uh, deer horns and uh, uh, horse hair and uh, sharp teeth he might have burned by, by sending electricity through them. I don't know, but we can only speculate. But at the end, he found out if you take a certain kind of wire and you bend it in a funny way, and then you put it in a vacuum into a glass vacuum, and then you put a certain current of electricity through it, then boom, light bulb went off. He found the right combination. That's also why even a genius like Edison at the end, of course, then they all came back. It's like, oh, what a genius, what a genius, right? But then he also said, look, genius is 1% one, 1 inspiration and 99% perspiration. He actually was big on inspiration. The story goes, and I never verified that, but he also, in order to create these new combinations, he used dreams a lot because sometimes you get stuck, you know, get stuck with something. I don't know, maybe he was stuck with a peacock tail, putting electricity through it, and, you know, he got stuck in this idea. And in dreams, you kind of like, un, you know, unravel things, crazy things happen, new combinations come up in, in all of our dreams. So he, he, that's how the story goes, he used that. He would, for example, doze off in his lab and he would have something like something of metal, I don't know, uh, in his hand. And then when he was almost falling asleep, he would drop that and that would wake him up. And then he would write down whatever he like, you know, when you start to begin to dream and you have these dozing new combinations, weird things that come up and he would write it down immediately. And according to what they say, that was very productive in order to come up with new combinations. And that's how he invented new things. So let's see how many combinations we can get out of, let's say, 8,000 kinds of chemicals Edison had, right? Okay, 8,000 kinds of chemicals. So if we have 8,000 kinds of chemicals and we choose one, we can have 8,000 choices, 8,000 combinations. We can send electricity, we can try out 8,000 different things and see if it works. We send electricity through each one of them and see, see if it works. But let's look at the math. <laughs> so if I have 8,000, I choose two, how many do I get? Well, I can choose the first and the second, the first and the third, the first and the fourth, the first and the fifth, and the first and the eight thousandth. Then the second and the third, the second and the fourth, the second, the fifth, and the second and the eight thousandth. And then the third and the fourth, the third, and so forth. So let's work out the math. We get 32 million different possible combinations already. Now, if I choose Three out of 8,000, it's the first, second, the third, the first, the second, the fourth, the first, the third, the fifth, the first, the third, the eighth. So, okay, so how many do I get there? 85, so that's million, billion. And 8,000 choose four, I get, okay, how a million, billion, trillion, 170 trillion. So now we can do that four, five, choose five, choose six, choose seven, and then sum it all up because that's the amount of combinations you can do. Luckily, as so often in math, yay math, there is a shortcut and we can just summarize the sum of the, all the possible n choose k with two to the power of the number that we have. What, how many should we have? 8,000, okay. So let's calculate that. Here have my calculator. Two to the power of 8,000. Can you see that? Yeah, two to the 8,000 is equal to shirt. Well, it doesn't compute, at least not on this calculator. So yes, it's a, it's a huge number <laughs> that actually it's way too many. So the power of combinatorics is once again, exponential and that has big implications. The basic logic is basically the story of combination. And that's just, you know, that's how you and me combine. That's how we combine when we play Lego or when you paint a picture, it doesn't matter if you want to do, want to be innovative in the arts or you want to be innovative in the engineering or in good old construction, you just take building blocks and you build something. By the way, this is also what mother nature does when she evolves. She takes building blocks, and with mutation, selection, and retention, she tests out through evolution new combinations. Not every mutant is useful. Actually, the vast majority of mutants are not, but the mutants are also the crux for how ev evolution finds its new way forward. And then some things are invented 
Maybe sometimes maybe only once, like a specific cell or a specific organ that might be invented only once and then is used as a building block in a vast variety of offsprings that you know create different kind of, of families and species and so forth. So evolution works in a very similar way. If you want to know more about it, uh, the mathematical way how we model that uh, is called the polya urn model. So this urn model has had a lot of research, especially over the last three decades, and we understand it much better. But that's just one, maybe the main model I'm aware of, of how to explain innovation. And it works kind of like here, you know, kind of like a lottery. So you have a part and then Mother Nature draws out of that when, when she innovates in evolution. And there's been a lot of research that has been refining that since in the last, in the last, well, three decades since the 90s. And you can think about it like this. So you have certain building blocks that uh, you can draw from and then you recombine them. And then actually the beauty of these mathematical models is we can understand much better what evolution does, how in biology, but also how technology evolves and how society evolves. In the next course, we will go much more deeper into that, in technology and into society. But before we go much more into the, the theory, we won't do the mathematical model. Don't worry, I invite you to read that if that's your kind of, of spiel that, that, that you like to play. And today we will be much more practical, much more hands-on. All right, so let's see how one of the biggest innovators of them all, did it. Steve Jobs, and this has been known as the biggest talk ever given when Apple reinvented the phone, the introduction of the iPhone, one of the biggest innovations we have seen in history. Please have a look at this video. So what did he do? A widescreen iPod with touch controls. I remember the iPod, it was actually, so the iPod was not to the internet connected little, you can imagine a memory stick with songs on it. That's what basically is. So kind of like an evolution of the Walkman, just not with, with cassettes, but it was a memory stick with songs on it that you could plug in your ears and listen to it. A revolutionary mobile phone, so mobile phones were already also around, and a breakthrough internet communicator. A widescreen iPod, a mobile phone, a breakthrough internet communicator, an iPod, a phone, an internet communicator. So what he did is he basically combined stuff that already existed. By the way, all of that and more, the touchscreen and other things, they were all financed by public government money. We'll talk more about that in, in the next session. But then he reinvented the phone. He invented something, Apple, invented something. Now, did they invent something? Like, what did they invent? Did they really invent something? Like, what is an invention? Well, invention is also just new combinations. That's why people always say, you know, the invention of the wheel. I mean, that one came out of nowhere. No, no, no. Once you understand the theory, you can be certain. No, the wheel did not come out of no, not even the wheel, not even the light bulb came out of nowhere. Nothing comes out of no. Where? That's the interesting thing, it's a bootstrapping logic. Like new things come from the combinations, new combinations of existing things. Now, that's inventions, and we talked already in the last session about it. There's also um, innovation. So here's the profit of innovation, and we said invention is new combinations in the real of practical, technical possibilities, you might say. So you take technical things like what Steve Jobs there, but there are also innovations. And as I said, this is you know, this is how people use these terms, or oh, well, not all people, maybe some people might not use them like that, but in the literature of innovation theory, that's how we use it. Innovations are new combinations in economic social possibilities. So not all inventions become innovations. If you invent tango dancing washing machine, and I don't know if that will satisfy some kind of social need and economic demand. So usually innovations are derived from Invention, they are a subset of it, but to satisfy some demand, and the iPhone was, he reinvented, okay, so no inventor, he reinvented the phone, and certainly, you know, it hit the nerves of the time. We were all ready for a smartphone. And it also has to fit the historical context and the current context, and the society is just not ripe for it, or there are some things in place that just don't, don't fit. 
and some things are way ahead of the time and we, we rediscover them later. It's like, whoa, this civilization was way ahead. Like, why didn't we come up with that? And something you know, made us blind on seeing these. So it depends also on the historical context and, and, the, and the current uh, environment of where the innovations are born. But both of them come from new combinations. One interesting detail, more like a side note, refers to the question where these building blocks come from. So Steve Jobs reinvented their iPhone by new combinations of existing blocks. But where did they come from? Have a look at this short video here. So what this little clip showed is that all the main building blocks of the iPhone have been provided and financed by the government, by the public sector, the internet, cellular communication, GPS, the microchip, voice recognition, the touch screen, um, all have been provided from our funds, from public funds. We paid that with our taxpayers' money, and then somebody invented it, most often at universities, often through military funding too. Um, and then it was picked up by the private sector and Steve Jobs picked up the pieces, recombined them and created the biggest one of the biggest technological innovations that we had. And why is that? Why do we often find, very often find, that inventions are government, public funded? Well, because inventions are very risky business. You take the, these many, many combinations of many, many possible combinations of thousands of millions of different possible combinations. And, you know, you just tinker around and you, you often don't find anything. Most often you fail. I would say the vast majority you fail. So if you will go, go to an entrepreneur and say, like, I have this great idea. You fail 99.9% .9 of the time. You're going to burn your money. You're like, who would be crazy enough to, to, put, to put their money on the table? That's why we say, well, we still want to advance. So whose money are we going to put on the table for such a risky business with such a high failure rate? Well, let's, let's put all in the pot a little bit, right? Let's make a potluck. And like we all put something in the pot and then, you know, we take some people who were really good at tinkering things and we give them tenure jobs at universities and we give them money different ways. In our country here in the United States, we often go through military funding because we also needed for the military uh, these inventions to be ahead of other nations because we want to be ahead of other nations. In others, it can on Europe, it all often goes to the European Commission. So the European Commission collects money from everybody in Europe and then they invest a billion dollars to simulate the brain, for example. And, and there's a very high failure rate uh, with this. But, you know, who should shoulder it else if not all of us? So that is the logic why it is extremely often that inventions come from the government and entrepreneurs turn them into innovations and, and reap the benefits. But, but that's important to understand because often we, we celebrate the private sector a lot and then we condemn the public sector of not being innovative enough. And of course, it's not the government's, the public sector business to innovate in that sense, but it has a crucial enabling role that it creates the inventions, which then are picked up by the private sector and our system and our market system to solve problems and to satisfy the demands of society through market mechanisms of supply and demand, and therefore they become innovations. What we will do today then is we're going to design digital innovations ourselves. And I'm very much looking forward to what you come up with. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. In the meantime, I will show you some examples. So here we have our um, 21 digital trades. And we're going to go through all the possible combinations. How many are there? N choose K. So N is 21. And then we sum it all up with our binomial sum formula that I showed you before. So we know the shortcut, it's two to the 21. And so, hey, only 2 million combinations that we will go through. I hope you get ready because, no, <laughs> just kidding. We will not go through all the 2 million, 100,000 possible combinations that we go. We go through maybe a dozen of, of different ways of looking at it and hopefully very quick. And then the most important thing is that you pick some of them and you come up with your own innovations. I'm very much looking forward to that part of, uh, of today's session.